we are going to get started. Um, I am so excited to see this wonderful, big, happy crowd here. This is so great. Um, July is often one of the smaller salons, I think, because it's supper time. But this is the this is the same crowd we always have. So it's great. Um, I'm so happy. I am Whitney Scherer, and uh, I'm one of the co-organizers of the Arlesa Opera Salon. I am totally delighted to be here, uh, and I um, am so happy to tell you that we have three wonderful readers tonight. We've got Mark Eichen, Daphne Calate, and Shuba Sunder reading tonight, and all of them are. Uh, Writers of many things, but writers of short stories, and they'll all be reading short stories this evening, uh, which is going to be really, really fun. Uh, I have a few little tiny bits of housekeeping that I have to get through before we get going. Uh, the Arlington Author Salon is a free reading series with a twist. Each author's presentation includes a sensory element to complement their reading, whether it be music, photos, smells, tastes, all sorts of different things. Um, and we are thrilled to be able to host this event at Kickstand so that we can experience all of these senses. It did not work quite as well on Zoom. Uh, we were limited more to the visual. <laughs> Although, actually, one time we had somebody make and eat cookies and then describe what they tasted like, which <laughs> sounded like a fantastic idea, but I think we were all just like... <laughs> so, um, it, was, it was a great idea, but it didn't quite work. Um, so uh, this one takes place quarterly. It's been going on for about eight years. And the next one is coming up on October 5th. Uh, and the lineup for that one is, oh, we've got Jennifer Haig, Josh Barkin, and Helen Elaine Lee reading, uh, reading at that salon. So they're all friends. Uh, and they actually came to us as a unit and said, we would like to read this one. We were like, ah, oh, cool. Very fun when they all the authors know each other. So that's going to be a good one. Be sure to mark your calendars. And we'll send out uh, information about that as it draws closer. Um, tonight, each author will read for 15 minutes, and they'll have time within that 15 minutes for their whatever sensory element that they have brought along with them. And then at the end of the readings, after they've all read, they're all three going to come up on stage and uh, do a Q&A. So if you have questions while, while they're reading, just hold on to them in your mind, and then you can ask them of the authors at the end. Uh, and tonight, one of our readers, Mark, has actually brought some refreshments, some cheese and crackers, and some wine with him, which is so lovely. Uh, and we're actually going to adjourn to the patio outside after the reading um, in order to enjoy those. So if you'd like to stick around and do that, you're more than welcome to do so. Mike from the Book Rack is in the back of the store. He has books for sale um, for Daphne and Shuba, and he has a mailing list for Mark's book because his book is coming out at the end of the year. Um, and so please feel free, if you're interested in buying books, please buy books, uh, give them those gifts, summer beach reading, you know, whatever you want to do. Uh, and be sure to sign up for Mark's mailing list so that you can be alerted when his book comes out. Um, OK, so um, thank you so much to the kickstand. This is our favorite. We've done this event here since the very beginning. Love it. It's so cozy and wonderful. Thank you to Emily and her whole staff. Um, and thank you so much to Sarah and the Arlington Library. They are our partners in this event. Thank you to ACMI who comes and records it. That's why we have, we have like multiple microphones. Um, they will be available online after the event, which is very, very cool. So we're happy to have that. And thank you as well to the Arlington Libraries Foundation, which funds uh, this event series. And we're happy that we are able to um, give little honorariums to authors and make this whole thing possible. And um, I'm just going to read their mission statement because it is quite impressive. The ALF is dedicated to helping open the doors to all who are curious, creating an inclusive space for the Arlington community and ensuring the library's future as the cornerstone of the community for generations to come. Supporting the Robbins and Fox branch libraries, the foundation works to create a place where readers and resources connect. The Arlington Foundation raises funds to bridge the gap between assets and aspirations in order to maintain a world-class library. We help support current programs and launch new initiatives. The Foundation believes the libraries are more than physical spaces to find books. They are windows into adventure, innovation, creativity, community, and opportunity. We strive to make that possible by investing in the libraries we love. Um, and I feel like this event series is also a little window into adventure and innovation, and I think that is what tonight will be as well. So. Um, with that, I will introduce our first author of the night, and we will get started. 
So first up tonight is Daphne Calate. Uh, so happy to have her here with us tonight. Daphne's books include the award-winning novels Russian Winter, Sight Reading, and Blue Hours, and two story collections, Calamity and Other Stories, which was shortlisted for the Story Prize, and The Archivists, winner of the Grace Paley Prize. Published in over 20 languages, her work has won fellowships from the Christopher Isherwood Foundation, McDowell, and Yano. She lives in Somerville, Massachusetts. Let's welcome Daphne. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so grateful to Whitney and to Ajali, who's not here, um, for inviting me to read here. And um, also, thanks to Emily for opening the cafe up, and Sarah, who's going to help me with the presentation. One of the things that's exciting to me about tonight is the prompt that we are allowed to use. Um, I'm going to try something brand new. Um, so my book that I'm going to read from, which is new, is called The Archivists. Um, this is what it looks like. And the title story is called The Archivist, and I've never read from it because I thought, oh no, it's too difficult to follow if you're listening because it intertwines three different storylines, and I don't know if people can follow. And when I was given the prompt, I immediately thought, oh, I know what I want to use, a photograph. I want to use the photograph that's on my refrigerator door, which is a photograph of my grandmother. And, uh, and then I thought, oh man, that would be a great photograph for the story. I, I thought of it because my grandmother inspires a lot of my writing. She's inspired uh, a couple of the stories in this book. And then when I thought specifically of this story, I thought, oh, that's interesting because the second storyline, actually, the picture I have in mind is a photograph of my mother. So then I thought, maybe I can use three different photographs for the three different storylines. So you're going to see what might to you be a very boring PowerPoint tonight. <laughs> <laughs> because it's just three photographs over and over. <laughs> and, hey, I'm, you know. Um, and I'm not going to get through the whole story. You're just going to hear the beginning of the story. But my hope is that you'll start to see not only thematically um, well, you, maybe you'll just see thematically how the story is maybe um, braiding together, but hopefully that you'll also um, be curious to see the other ways in which the story lies in the end in the plot. So, the archivist. Ottawa, March 28th. At the chief guest desk in her living room, the grandmother writes to her granddaughter, my darling, thank you for the flowers. The petals are the exact color blue. I will have Sable take a picture. For dinner, we are having roast duck. Also soup, potatoes, asparagus, and a chocolate cake. Don't worry, we have two ducks. Love, Luca. The flowers, blue hydrangeas, are a gift for her birthday. Big, plump, periwinkle clusters, like outrageous compounds. The vase arrived at a shiny pink ribbon tied around in a bow, but the grandmother found it inelegant and removed it. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm just going to stand here. Her daughter, Leah, is already in the kitchen. There are the two ducks to roast, plus the vat of soup to start simmering not to mention the side dishes for Sable, her grandson's wife, a vegetarian. The grandmother pushes herself up from the desk. With the aid of a cane fashioned after a stalk of bamboo, she makes her way to the narrow, fluorescent-lit kitchen, where Leah is arranging the ducks side by side on the enormous roasting table. No heads or feet, just the cold, plump bodies, firm and slick. The grandmother stands at the kitchen doorway to watch her daughter truss the stubby legs with twine. She likes to make certain everything is prepared the right way. In an underheated dance studio in New York City, a retired ballerina stretches her leg from passe into developing. Over her thin leotard, she wears loose sweatpants and a little bolero-style knit sweater tied in a knot at her breastbone. Not quite so high, she explains, her leg fully outstretched. 
toes pointed at the air in their tight leather slippers. It feels good, the strong reach of her leg, the arch of her foot, muscles extended in a single focused intention. The young star she's coaching, a dancer with her hair in a high blonde ponytail, repeats the movement, too eager. Her effort is visible, beads of sweat crowning her forehead, her leg jabbing at the air rather than piercing it. The combination she's learning, choreographed a quarter century before her birth and intensely difficult, hasn't been danced in three decades. The retired ballerina's name is Bryn. She's 68 years old and works in Houston as a consultant to the ballet. Off to NYC and into distant memory, she wrote last night to registered fans on her blog while waiting for her flight to New York. She has promised her doctor to do nothing that will in any way strain her bad knee. The two trust ducks are slid into the oven. The grandmother secretly worries two won't be enough. She has this same worry every year. The fact that there are always leftovers in no way eradicates the residual hunger cautioning her to worry once again. Clinging to her cane, she tugs over the refrigerator door and peers at the crowded shelves, searching for the turkey scraps for the soup. Wings, just the tips, less expensive. And a neck. Leah says, let me get those, and lifts the styrofoam trays, shovels them to the sink, winces the cold, slippery turkey parts under the faucet. In the stock pot, wedges of parsnip and carrot sizzle against sweating layers of a quartered onion. With a wooden spoon, the grandmother nudges the vegetables to the edge of the pot to make room for the turkey parts. Leah drops the neck and wings in and lets them splutter for a bit, then covers everything with water and sets the lid partially across the top. The grandmother turns the flame higher. In a laboratory a few miles northeast of Los Angeles, two research associates are beginning the day's work. It's 9.30 a.m. The study is at an early stage. Data collection. Simple. Repetitive. The first subject to arrive is a 27-year-old girl. Woman, the first researcher, also a woman, grumbles to her colleague, a man, who sees nothing demeaning in referring to women as girls. It's infantilizing, the female research, researcher explains. Her colleague explains that he would never use the word girl for anyone who isn't actually young. For women too old to be girls, he prefers the term ladies. Practicing the deep, full breaths she has been advised to engage in at such moments, the female researcher heads down the hallway to the room where she will collect the girls' data. Before entering, she taps a quick into her smartphone about men who call women girls. As much as her Twitter account is a diversion, it is also a record of her daily thoughts and activities. To not record something would mean she believes to lose it. The solo the young blonde star is to learn was choreographed in 1969 in protest against the Vietnam War. All wars, the choreographer later clarified, and told of his mother's beloved blue-eyed brother who died in the labor camp. The dance, Forced March, was first performed on a sweltering July evening at the Jacobs Pillow Festival in Massachusetts. In the Times the next day, the critic wrote of Bryn's, quote, dignified carriage giving way to fury and heartbreak, and of the way she, quote, seemed to radiate perseverance in the face of infinite pain. Photographs from the date show a young, round-cheeked Bryn in a black leotard with a thin white belt at her waist. The expression on her online face resolute. Though brief, the dance required prodigious strength. By the end, the floor of the stage was wet from her perspiration. For the entire 14 minutes that she was dancing, she could feel the pancake makeup melting. From that night forward, each time she performed it, 
she told herself it was her very last dance. She told, oh, she felt it her duty to use up everything she had. Sweat pasting her leotard to her skin, veins pulsing, bruises emerging on her knees where she sometimes felt too hard. Just a limp, wet rag, that was how she felt by the end. It was a wonderfully satisfying feeling. I looked online, says the young star. They're taking a break, drinking water from big plastic bottles emblazoned with the company's logo. I guess it's true no one ever filmed it. I wonder why. I found lots of recordings of you, but none of this one. The grandmother's other guests have begun to arrive. First her son, Benji, and now her grandson, Dave, his six-month-old baby, and his wife, Sable, the vegetarian. Everyone is cooing at the baby, an oblivious creature packed into a car basket. It's thanks to the baby that Dave and Sable have moved back to, to Kingston to be closer to family. As the grandmother is embraced by Sable, her cheeks soft and cool, Dave sets down the manifold bags that accompany the baby on even the shortest of travels. Already, Sable's complimenting the grandmother's fine color, how lovely she looks. Somehow, her flattery always seems genuine. In fact, the grandmother has always found herself fascinated by Sable. Her easy manner, calm, untroubled, that air of steady contentment. Even now, a new mother, Sable appears relaxed about the baby and seems to have gotten enough sleep, which Leah always claims to find suspicious, but the grandmother secretly admires. Happy birthday, Benji's saying, holding out the gift he's brought, a glazed ceramic pot containing a bright blue hydrangea. The research associates are collecting data concerning a gene connected to the regulation of stress hormones. That's all they've been told. They don't yet know that their subjects have come to this study via archives within 20 years ago. They do not know that the archives, founded by a famous film director, are video testimonies collected from around the world, recorded for an institute now located here at the university. The testimonies describe starvation, brutality, and death. They speak of life in ghettos, in hiding, in camps, in forests, in alleys, on the run. Instead of watching archived videos, the laboratory researchers read swabs of DNA. The institute began collecting samples over a decade ago in an effort to reconnect dispersed families and identify bodily remains. But the researchers have been employing the samples toward a different end, an ongoing study of intergenerational effects of extreme trauma. Specifically, how the stresses of the Holocaust may have altered the DNA, not only of Holocaust survivors, but also of their descendants. Epigenetic inheritance is the term. Environment, environmentally caused modifications of genetic material via chemical tags that attach themselves to DNA. In previous studies, Jewish Holocaust survivors and their offspring were shown to share the same epigenetic tags. While the control group, Jewish families living outside of Europe during the war, didn't. This new study will test the theory that epigenetic tags are passed not only to children, but to grandchildren. Louder. The blue of the second hydrangea, the one from her son, is very close to that of the first, but slightly more violet. The petals, bright and absurdly healthy, could be leaves from some oversized blue clover or the wings of a strange blue butterfly. The grandmother has her son set the planter on the teak desk. Meanwhile, atop the round glass coffee table, the bouquet from her granddaughter in California makes a sort of altered reflection, periwinkle blossoms spilling over the lip of the vase. The plant from her son has a small white tag dangling over the edge of the ceramic pot. Hydrangea, written in looping script. The grandmother leans closer to read the tag. Hydrangeas require plenty of light and daily watering. 
A hydrangea is a symbol, oh, is a symbolic way to say, thank you for understanding. She looks over to the coffee table, at the vase bursting with the hydrangea blossoms. Those periwinkle ones from her granddaughter are the light ones. Brynn massages the area around her knee. So far, so good. She just needs to remember to ice it when she gets back to the hotel. For a few years, the forced march solo was her signature piece, created for her when she was yet 20. Danced for the first minutes in silence, with live drumming gradually layered in. The piece begins slowly, meditatively, building to a frenzy, and then ultimately calming itself. Among the photographs of her on her website is one of a young, fearless Bryn hurling herself across the stage while a stern-faced drummer plays impassively behind her. It was flattering and honor to have a dance made for her, even if she had also been fending off the choreographer's advances for some time. After she left the company for a troupe in San Francisco, the dance was retired from the repertoire and never performed again. When the choreographer died a few years ago, Bryn spoke lovingly, if with carefully chosen words, at his memorial service. Her work with this new star is part of a project to archive lost dances. It began as an internet campaign and has since received national attention. Bryn finds the online platform GoFundMe, perhaps. It seems these days anyone can ask for money for anything and astonishingly receive it. Once revived, Bryn's piece will be publicly performed, recorded, and added to an electronic archive. Dances long forgotten, the funding page explains, will exist once again, recalled, performed, and shared in perpetuity. And I'll stop there. And thank you guys for your patience as we brought in more chairs. Um, that's always a good sign. <laughs> Um, and thank you for that to Daphne, that was so good. I want to read the rest of the story. <laughs> uh, next up, we have Shuba Sunder, uh, who is the author of Boomtown Girl, a story collection that won the 2021 St. Lawrence Book Award and was a finalist for the Flannery O'Connor Prize for Short Fiction. Her writing has appeared in places like Catapult, The Common, and Narrative Magazine and has been shortlisted for Best American Short Stories. She has received fellowships from the Massachusetts Cultural Council, the Boston Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture, and the Corporation of Ghetto. Her debut novel, Optional Practical Training, I love that title, it's so funny, um, is forthcoming from Grable Press in 2025. Is that correct? Okay. I looked it up and I was like, that sounds like forever away. And then I was like, oh, it's not. <laughs> it's like a year away, it's crazy. Oh, um, so that's exciting. Uh, she teaches creative writing at Massachusetts College of Art and Design. Let's welcome Shuba. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, it's so nice to be here. Thank you, Whitney and Anjali and Absentia um, and everyone who helped put this together. It's an honor to be here. Um, and I love the element of the, well, I love the sensory element of this program because um, for me, especially you know, writing this book, which is set entirely in my hometown of Bangalore, India, um, in the 90s. So, you know, it's displaced in both time and space because I wrote it, you know, here. Um, the way I, I access the place of my childhood um, is you know, through my sensory memories, and I'm sure you know, everyone has had the experience of you know, listening to a phrase of music or you know, getting a whiff of something and just being transported, um, and you know, I, I rely on that. Um, and so I passed around a bowl of this, what's a fairly ubiquitous snack in South India called murku, um, and it's, it's gluten and dairy free. Um, so. I guess that's a concern. Um, and there's not enough for everyone, but um, hopefully you know, uh, anyone who wants a little bit can, can find a morsel. Um, so I'll read uh, excerpts from two stories uh, from my collection, 
And I mean, really, one of my goals in, in writing this book was to uh, sort of make a portrait or a, a sort of chorus of voices um, to capture, you know, Bangalore uh, in this very particular time in the '90s, which is when I sort of came of age, and when the city transformed from what was really a sort of backwater um, in India. Bangalore was never supposed to be a big city like Delhi or um, Mumbai. Um, in this like, little you know, town, really, uh, to a mega metropolis in the Silicon Valley of South India. Um, and I have characters of different ages um, throughout the book, so I'll read an excerpt from one story that centers on, a, on an elderly character, and an excerpt from a story that um, focuses on a young person. A very full day. He was, locals agreed, the quintessential Kavarinagar retiree. In his wool silk trousers, navy blue sweater, and plaid scarf wrapped tight about the ears, C.K. Rajgopal, former Air India pilot, cut a lithe, solitary figure as he strode down 8th Main. On his feet, he wore the ergonomic shoes his son had brought for him from America, designed for trekking off the Indian sidewalks, his son had said. The shoes had, for the past weeks, felt heavy, like stones tied to his ankles. But this morning, strangely, it was no longer so. Perhaps his leg muscles had needed time to adjust to their new load. Perhaps he was rejuvenated by the winter air. Whatever the reason, as he made his way to Wadayad Lake, past the provision store and the barber shop, still shuddered at this early hour, past the temple and the sugarcane juice stall, Mr. Rajkopal experienced a likeness, as if the ground were falling away from him and he were floating, gliding, over the pavement stones and under the gold through clouds of golden dust, churned by the municipal workers' brooms. At the lake, he found Mundi, his friend from the Kaveri Senior Center, waiting for him on the bench. Auto rickshaws are on strike today, Mundi said, so I can't see my cardiologist. Good, Mr. Rajgopal said. You won't have to waste your time. What will he tell you? That you're getting old. You have no health problems, CK, so you can't understand my problems. If you eat lugdoos all the time, Mundi, how can you expect your heart not to suffer, eh? If you eat healthily all the time, CK, then you know what will happen? You will die a healthy man. <laughs> they set off on their daily loop, Murthy laughing at his own joke, while Mr. Rajgopal rotated his arms to exercise his shoulder joints, warm in a long-sleeved woolen sweater knitted for him by his late wife. Earlier that morning, she appeared in a vision, crouched on the floor with her back to him, shelling peas. As he drew nearer, she twisted around, her hair disheveled, her face contorted in rage. Her mouth opened, she began to curse. She pronounced him a demon, a monster, a selfish bastard, names she had never once uttered in their half century of marriage. He opened his eyes and watched the contours of the room swim into view. From the guava tree by the window, a parrot shrieked. He sat up and swung his feet to the floor. By the time he was in the kitchen heating water for his shade, he had dismissed her words. Dreams were little more to him than a sign of fitful sleep that lifelong condition suffered by all career pilots. Slow down, Siki, Muthi said, and Mr. Rajgopal slowed his pace. They were approaching the far side of the lake where the occasional lotus bloomed. The two men discussed how the chief minister had done a decent job restoring the city's parks, how the rural population, feeling neglected, was going to give him the boot in the next election. They took turns prophesying the country's future, neither man expressing full, full agreement with the other, yet not explicitly disagreeing either. By the time they returned to their starting point at the bench, both felt a renewed conviction in their views. You're coming to the center this evening, Murphy said, for the astrologer's talk. I hear he is going to tell us about the origins of the universe. And he's an astronomer, Murphy. Astronomer, correct. He's also Romilo Mukherjee's nephew, are you aware? He has spent the last 15 years abroad, at Yale, Stanford, Oxstra, Oxford, etc. Now he is back in Bangalore at the Institute. Mr. Rajkopal gazed across the water. The lake was barely a pond, so small that he could distinguish a heron on the other side roosting in a eucalyptus tree. During his flying years, his vision had been perfect. Even now, through his spectacles, he could make out the bird's serpentine neck and downward slanting beak. I ran into Romila yesterday at the Murkhu. Murthy continued. She wanted to know if you were coming. What did she say? I just told you, Siki. She asked if you would be there at the talk. Why are you laughing, Murthy? 
She is your friend, is she not? Your lady friend, to be more precise. A very fine lady, CK, if you will permit me to say. Mr. Rajgopal watched the heron rise into the air, its legs dangling like a single stray branch. I always come to the lectures, he said stiffly. It is how I keep the mind active. Murthy clapped him on the back. You are the most consci conscientious among us, CK, and the fittest. Dragon girl. The girl was the dragon's head. Green cardboard scales, eyes the size of cricket balls, crocodile mouth spilling crinkly orange flames. Inside the papier mache shell, a state of perpetual dust, gray and cool and slightly dizzy making, breath swirling about her ears, fumes of drying fevicol. Outside, a broiling afternoon in a year of severe drought the closing day of a six-week arts class. In the vast compound of a British era mansion, before an open-air stage, an audience of 30 or so parents sat beneath a mango tree and fanned themselves with newspapers. An occasional gust of wind set off a drizzle of half-ripened fruit. In 10 years' time, the tree would be felled, the mansion demolished, the city's ponds gone to mud and flies. But on that day, late in the millennium, the mangoes fell by themselves as a chorus sang from behind a bamboo screen. Custard the dragon had big sharp teeth and spikes on top of him and scales underneath. The girl was 12 years old. The mask came down to her waist. With her hands at her shoulders, she gripped Custard by the molars and drove forward. A train of children followed, lined up in descending order of height, green cones strapped to their heads to form the dragon's spiny length. It was the girl's first time as a leader, a role she'd earned by her superior height. In public, her body did not know how to carry itself. The growth spurt that had rounded her hips and chest also left her gangly and muggy. Under the mask, with no one watching, she could lengthen her neck, she could pick up her head. Beneath the blazing sun, the dragon bristled and reared and whipped his fiery step, snapped. When the pirate came on stage, waving his plastic pistols, the girl charged him with vigor almost ripping the green bedsheet that tied her to Custard's body. Neither of her parents were there to applaud the performance. Friends did not gather around afterwards to say congratulations or keep in touch. She had a tendency to shy away from people, her face contorted as if in a scowl. Girls whispered to each other that she talk, thought too much of herself. Boys snuck up behind her and yanked at her braid. You're bigger than they are, the teacher said when she complained. Can't you stand up for yourself? That same teacher, after the performance, might have given some words of praise. Well done, Nancy. Nice to see you smiling for a change. Have a little confidence and you will go far. But after the adults had clapped and made their way out from under the mango tree, after the dragon's head had been placed in the middle of the stage for all to admire, after a domestic from the girl's household dispatched to pick her up had searched frantically all over the mansion grounds, it was concluded the girl had disappeared. For an hour, she roamed the unfamiliar streets. Her sandals grew slippery with grime. Her eyes burned from the heat and the smog. She maintained a brisk pace, looking only ahead, as if she had walked these paths a thousand, ten thousand times, as if she had a destination and no time to waste. She passed compound walls veined with mold and crowned with broken villa, three-story apartment buildings in whose driveways kids her age were playing cricket. The shade was patchy, the four o'clock sun strong, Already her entire body felt dirty, as if she'd been rubbed with oil and gold and dust. She hadn't eaten since breakfast. Her stomach was a knot. Not treasure would have reached home by now, or maybe he went straight to her mother's boutique on the little road. Her mother would be screaming at him, ordering him to get out and find the girl and not dare show his face again until he had brought her back. She passed a college with a granite facade and windows bordered in green. Teenagers were idling about on the pavement, some smoking, others nicking on the seats of their tumblers. Monson paused to watch. Useless youngsters, the father would have said, when I was their age, I was spending my free time reading Sanskrit poetry. They knew that this country is going to the dogs. What's up, girlie? The student in the Kadi Kurta called to her. Why are you staring? Nice jeans, said Kurta's companion, a young woman in a purple dress. Where'd you get them? Nancy looked down at her clothes and caught a whiff of her own perspiration. In her bathroom were sandalwood scented soaps, sun silk shampoos, lotions infused with almond and rose. 
She liked to take a bath as soon as she felt even a little bit dirty, which meant sometimes she bathed two or three times a day. How long, she wondered, until her next wash. You don't know English, eh? Purple said. You live nearby? Kurta asked in Canada. The students were sitting side by side on the curb, observing her with friendly interest. Nancy replied in Canada. She had picked up the language as a toddler, surrounded as she had been by servants who spoke it. I live far away, in a village. Oh, really? Kurta said. What does your father do? He's a farmer. He has a bullock cart. He works in the fields. The kid thinks she looks like a villager, Purple said, reverting to English. Tell us some more stories, Gurley. Where's this high, where's this high class village of yours? I am a dragon. My name is Custard. The students frowned at each other. Mental case, Kurta said. Padded cell variety. You people are the mental cases, the girl said, and set off with a new spring in her knees. It felt good to be rude, to speak nonsense to strangers and saunter off. The knot in her stomach had loosened. In the shade of a jacaranda tree, she reached for her squeezy bottle and caught the lukewarm fountain of water in her mouth. She took out her tomato sandwich, a pink sticky mess in its plastic wrap, and ate it in three bites. Around the corner was a small street market. Passing a cart piled high with mangoes, she grabbed one and dropped it into her bag before the vendor or anyone else could see. It was her first time stealing. She strode past stands selling lakes, handkerchiefs, and sticker babies, men and, men's and women's underwear, plastic buckets. When she went shopping with her mother to boutiques and showrooms in the cantonment area, she passed pavement stalls like these, stocked with colorful, dusty wares that her mother would never deign to buy. Now she fingered a red and orange tukota hanging from a hook on a board. It felt rough and slippery at the same time, a material she had never before touched. If the street weren't so crowded, if the vendor, sitting a foot from her, hadn't looked at her like he knew she was up to no good, she might have tried to filch it. <coughs> a few blocks past the street market was a small park. She sat on a bench, took out the mango, and sank her teeth into, the, into its leathery skin. For a long while, she sat there. A breeze cooled her sticky face. Three crows fought over the mango seed she tossed to the ground. An ant wandered over her hand. I can sit here forever, she thought, like the man in the fable who stood so long in the forest that the vines grew up his legs. She closed her eyes. The wind whispered in the rain trees. When she opened her eyes, she saw a figure standing before her. It was a man, red-mouthed and yellow-eyed, lifting a fingerless hand to his face. Beggars were not a problem from the car. Natrajan simply rolled up the window to keep their dirt and diseases outside. Once, while walking down Commercial Street with her mother, a beggar child her own age with wild brown hair had tugged at her t-shirt. Before she could react, her mother said, cheap, and slapped the beggar, ha beggar child's hand away. She then held her own hand, the one that had dealt the slap, away from her body until they reached home, where she scrubbed the death hall and instructed her daughter to do the same. Otherwise, you'll get leprosy, she said. Now the girl recoiled from the beggar man, tucking her knees against her chest. He raised his other hand, which had fingers. It was an amputee, Nancy Monty saw, not a leper. She shook her head to say she had no money. Looking down, the man unwound the front of his dhoti until his penis flapped out. It stretched this way and that before pointing straight at her, like a snake coming out of a hole, preparing to bear its fangs. A row of canna bobbed their scarlet heads as she ran, trying to find a gate she'd come through. The sun was getting lower, its light ripening. When she found a gap, she tripped, fell, and scraped her hands. This stretch of sidewalk was deserted, darkened by overhanging rain trees, whose roots had warped and cracked the paving stones. At any moment, the man could spring out from behind a tree trunk. When the pavement ended in a deep trench, forcing her onto the road and into the traffic, it was something of a relief to be cocooned by the swerving motorcycles, the warm, salty fumes of exhaust, the glaring bus rides. I'll stop there. Thank you. That was so visual. It was like, in that world, <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so our final reader for the night is Mark Eichen. Mark has a PhD from the Graduate School of Geography at Clark University. From 2015 to 2019, he was a vis visiting faculty member at the State University of Zanzibar. His fiction focuses on life in Zanzibar and in Red State America. 
His stories have appeared in Still Points Arts Quarterly, the Adirondack Review, West Trade Review, Toyon, and Rome Turn. He is the winner of the Richard Cortez Day Prize in Fiction. Current projects include a book of short stories in both Swahili and English to be published in Dar es Salaam in 2023, uh, at the end of this year, um, a mystery set in Zanzibar, and a novel of loss and renewal set in Sandpoint, Idaho. So he has uh, a mailing list and I think an excerpt of his work as well available in the back uh, at, the, at, the book, at the book table. So you can get that at the end of the night. Welcome, Mark. So thanks very much, uh, Whitney and Anjali in, in absentia. Um, and uh, to the Kickstand Cafe, it's so lovely to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, the sensory experience that I've uh, brought with me is uh, Congress. These are Zanzibar Congress. And um, so the Congress in, uh, in Zanzibar are used for everything. They're, they're made as uh, skirts, uh, mostly, but people use them uh, to do all sorts of things. They cover tables with them, or they uh, cover openings in people's houses with them. Zanzibar Congas in particular have little sayings on them. They're called Swahili Mathali. And uh, these are ways of com women communicate with other women, right, when they want to make a point. And so, you know, if you think that uh, one woman has the eye on uh, your uh, husband, you would uh, wear one that says, people who are in love, uh, the enemy has no opportunity. And, uh, and so, uh, so they're quite, uh, they're quite uh, communication. There's another level of communication going on. And so, uh, so these, are, these are Zanzibari congas. Um, um, the story that I'm going to uh, read from is called uh, Kutaroga. And um, uh, to escape, and it's from, as uh, Whitney has said, a book of stories called A Wind, Sand, and Sky to be published in Dar es Salaam by Kuki Naniota uh, in English and Swahili later this year. Uh, the stories are related in the sense that the same characters and places appear throughout, but the protagonists are different. In the first story, the protagonists are Zanzibaris. In the second story, the protagonist is a burned out American. And in this story that I'm going to read from, there's a uh, protagonist that's a Zanzibar man and a uh, British woman. And it's a love story of sorts. Uh, it doesn't end well for either of them, but it doesn't end entirely unhappily. Um, so I'm going to read from the beginning and then skip to the end. Uh, there is some Swahili, but I think the meaning should be evident. and. Uh, it does end with one phrase that has a special meaning for Zanzibaris, and I'll explain it when I get there. Uh, before I begin, I want to have a special shout out to uh, my writers group and to the writers room of Boston, where I work, and uh, to the uh, book designer, Whitney, on this project, and my agent, uh, Kristen Shea at Blue Hen, and also to my editor, Allison Murphy. Um, every month, he mumbled to himself as he reluctantly marched upward, every month. Morocco scale a flight of half-broken wooden stairs to Uncle Yusuf's apartment. Heat and, ju and dust jumped off each step. His legs cement, he felt the sweat on his back under his shirt. Uncle Yusuf owned the agency that hotels called when they needed a guide, a driver, a ferry ticket, a woman or a man for the night. Those wanting regular work with foreigners, as Morabi did, paid Uncle a little something. And Uncle Yusuf, in turn, spread this little something to the street hustlers, the money changers, the newly hired assistant managers, and their lackey hotel clerks. This was insurance, as Uncle pointed out, not corruption. You wouldn't want Uncle to lose your phone number. And it was income redistribution in the grand tradition of the revolutionary government. In return for a little something, everyone got more or less what they needed. Nephew, 
humble voice echo through the dust in the stairway. I heard you were coming. About a dustico. What's the news of the day? Maraba reached the top of the stairs, removed his sandals, entered the small sitting room, and following Uncle's invitation, perched on the edge of the daybed covered in newspaper and plastic. The room never changed. The green paint was only partially hidden by a faded flag and a picture of the president shaking someone's hand. A flat screen TV played silently in one corner and the kitchen table occupied another. On it was a Tottenham Hotspur tea towel and a set of chip cups. The Dada poured tea. No news, Uncle. Uncle counted the money Murabu paid him and wedged it carefully next to the seat cushion of the warm green Victorian armchair. Thank you, nephew. I am grateful to God. Diabetic, sweating under the ever-turning ceiling fan, Uncle glanced at the television and the street below. Give my best to your family inn. Where is it again? Kidongi. Ah, yes, a lovely place. Have you been there, Uncle? Ah, so I hear. Murabu recognized this as the dismissal it was. Moments later, he bumped roughly down the stairs, lighter by many thousands of shillings. The tea glasses, no doubt, were already empty, ready for the next one from the village, desperate for work. Why is it, he asked the stairs, that I woke only here and there, but I must pay every month? Too loudly, Uncle's voice echoed in the stairway like dust. So many guides. So few jobs. At the bottom of the stairs, Saba shuffled in the alley's sliver of shade. They shared a room behind the chicken barbecue in Lavendi. You pay regularly, he said. Uncle must like you. How many months do you owe? I don't know. They began walking together. Should I remind you? How can I pay? Saba shrugged his shoulders and questioned. If I don't work. That, my friend, is a contradiction worthy of math. Remember, university? If you don't pay, you won't work. And if you don't work, you can't pay. True, but others have to eat, even before uncle. If you don't pay soon, you will never be able to work for uncle again. Of that, I'm sure. Maybe my sisters in Moonway will send a gift. Saba shook his head at this impossible prospect. What do you hear from your family? Look, Murabu took his phone from a pocket and flashed the screen at Saba. It was filled with texts. You can't drink the war much water from the village well. These days it tastes like the sea. They need money to buy water from the truck. You think they think you have money? They think I have more money than they do. True, Saba nodded. But what does Uncle say? You can't bleed the stones. Isn't that what he does to us? Murabu glanced over his shoulder and shook his head. The money in the box under my bed isn't growing. At this rate, I'll never build a house or get married. And you, you'll never see your famous fountain in Rome. That picture you have, you can't even afford a ferry ticket to Dar. Maybe you'll have to teach me so we can swim together. They both laughed at an old running joke between them. Saba able to swim, Murabu, like so many Zanzibaris, afraid of the water. In my dreams, I don't have to swim. I see the fountain every night. Saba smiled and looked away. You should take that picture off the wall before it makes you crazy. That look, Murabu saw it in Saba's eyes, and on too many mornings, he saw it in his own, looking back at him from the mirror. A long time ago, his father caught him with that look, staring down a path that led to the shore. You're going to stumble when you look to the horizon. His father cupped him on the head. When the next step is just here under your feet. He distrusted that look now as his father had then. But on those days when he had no work, when he woke up more tired than when he went to bed, he needed something beyond the stone buildings and the winding streets. Less time dreaming, more time working, he told Saba and himself. They threaded past families with their history wrapped in bedding and bags of clothes past taxis and trucks stalled in an unmoving queue on the road to the port. Sometimes, Saba still looking far away, 
dreams are more important than food. You just say that, except when you're hungry. Just past the breakwater, the night market was assembling, and the shirtless teens dove from the stone rampart into the sea. Jumping high off the wall, each boy held on to his precious instant of freedom, suspended between rising and falling. As twilight fell to darkness, the market stalls came alive and bare multicolored electric bulbs and gas lamps sputtering in the cooling night wind. The smell of potatoes fried in oil and the salt air from the harbor amplified their hunger. It beat like a drum. They sat together on the stone step, feeling each other's shoulder, and used a single toothpick to share chips and salad. There was tower music from the rooftop of a nearby Golden Tulip Hotel, probably an Armani wedding. Saba got out a bottle that had a wet rag as a stopper, something with orange soda and alcohol. The lights from the stalls and the night market were flashing, and Saba came close and said, almost in a whisper, I have a special question. And what would that be? Do you want something here, something sure? Or is it your freedom that you want? Saba passed the bottle to Marabu, who drank deeply in a single gulp and then passed it back. Why would you ask me this? I am asking because. Saba took another drink. Once you know the answer, you must not let anything or anyone stand in your way. And that would include you? Saba laughed, cradling the bottle. Marabu counted Saba's teeth and felt as if his legs were made of cheap plastic and everything around him began to tilt and spin. Fireworks left, lit the sky. Especially me, my friend, you're my friend. Especially me. Sarah. Sarah blinked exhaustion out of her eyes as she walked down the streets of Shangani among the gaggle of overheated tourists. Her phone buzzed in her pocket and she stole a glance as they paused in front of another building, one with a tailor shop and a woman with a beautiful smile selling bottles of homemade juice. It was her flatmate in London, the one that convinced Sarah into taking this trip after she had yet another half-drunken night of takeaway tandoori and cheap rosé. She didn't need much convincing. It'll help you get away from Mr. Doctor at the very least, her flatmate had said referring to the married man Sarah had been seeing haphazardly since before her own divorce had finalized. You in love yet? The text read. She rolled her eyes. Yes, she texted, with the coffee. She wished she had some coffee now. It was only her second day in Zanzibar, and the throb of jet lag had yet to dissipate. Still, it was thrilling being somewhere where she knew no one, had no associations, it made her think of that short poem she loved so much by Aristotle's Grimet, how far the world drew new and tall and filled, finally, with strangers. Her life in London felt that way, filled with strangers. But here, at least, the strangers were new. It made her fear of the world feel bigger. She tuned back in to the guide a tall, good-looking man with a professional charm who Sarah had begun to fancy. This is the house of a wealthy trader in the 1800s. Notice the chains and flowers in the wood carvings. And these large copper spikes on the door were designed to protect the house from the elephants which roam the island. Sarah ran her hand on the outside of the door. Elephants seemed like the kind of thing a tour guide at home might throw in to avoid revealing some grisly bit of history. Chains and flowers. She thought about the juxtaposition of chains and flowers. As the other tourists used selfie sticks to take their quota of pictures, she pulled the tour guide aside. Listen, she said, would it be possible to have a private tour? I'd like to see more of the real Zanzibar. She blushed and stumbled on. I mean, you know, to get a sense of the rhythm of daily life here. When he smiled broadly, she felt herself smiling reflexively back with a lightness she hadn't felt in months. I would be happy to give you an insider's tour. For you, here in Zanzibar, he chuckled, everything is possible. 
So now I'm going to read uh, toward the end of the story. After Marabu and Sarah have had an affair and their affair is ended, and Sarah is about to leave Zanzibar and return to England. Marabu asks Sarah to meet him before she leaves. And they fight and they reconcile again. And I'm reading from the beginning of the last scene and then at the end of the story. He sat in a far booth up on the roof of Swahili House and didn't order when the barman asked in English what he was drinking. Perhaps he looked as if he belonged up here above the scurry and bustle in the lanes below, but he felt none of it and only wondered if she would come. Up on this roof was their best moment while they were becoming friends before they were lovers and before they somehow got in each other's way. Maybe she would think so too and that would be enough to bring her. Marabu, I want you to have this. She handed him a small poetry book and I've marked the poem See the one we read? Thank you, Sarah. Karibu san, she said. They both were smiling. As you once told me, a little Swahili goes a long way, even with me to England. He watched her face, hoping to memorize it as they walked toward the lift. In my country, she said, this is where we would shake hands or even hug and wish each other well. I say we'll see each other soon, but I suppose that's not going to happen. Which part is not going to happen, Sarah? I suppose none of it. Not the hug or the handshake or even the wishing. I think this is something where we are more truthful. I don't imagine we will see each other soon. He hoped to draw the seconds out. Do you remember the poem, the one we read? Yes, of course. Do you remember the end where it says, he thumbed down through the book to the page Sarah had marked and scanned down. The poem says, But love is the sky and I am for you, just so long and long enough. That's how I want to think about this. It felt like love and it felt like freedom. And maybe it was that feeling of freedom that I was truly missing. Sarah put her hand on his shoulder. So, she asked softly, can we still do the wishing then? Yes, suppose we can still do the wishing. Well then, she had a passport and ticket in her hand as she brushed his. Take good care of yourself, Morocco, my friend. Safari and Gemma, Sarah, make Zanzibar tea that tastes like air. She laughed, pushed the button, got in the lift, turned, waved at him. The silver doors closed. Standing at the parapet, Marabo received the text. Tomorrow in the early morning, while the shadows were still long on the ground and before the streets were crowded, Uncle needed him to carry a gift, a little thing, to the new assistant manager of the Golden Tulip Hotel. You know the place, Uncle's text asked, beyond the old fort, beyond the house of wonders. As the wind whipped around him, he looked down to see Sarah hurrying to the ferry. The Masika was coming and its first drop slammed into him. It would take only a few minutes for the walls to begin to cool, for the dust to settle and the lanes to fill with rain. He stood and scanned the town, the port, the sky, the sea, and felt the certainty that this place made of stone had been here long before he arrived and would endure long after he was gone. The storm came in as it would this time every year, feeling the wind in his clothes, hearing the rain crash against the roof on which he stood, tasting it mixed with his sweat. Marabo lifted his arms in welcome. Yes, he told himself, there was much to be learned, much to remember. Within his life here, he was free to hear the stories visitors might tell about people in the villages and the wind blowing across beaches that stretched beyond the horizon. He was free to catch the stories of the Zanzibaris about politics and the market and the boys that come to town to discover who they might be. And if he listened carefully, he was free to hear the stories about heat and dust, love and truth, about what is real and what is dreamed, the stories of the Zanzibaris and the visitors might tell each other, Tuko Pomojo Milele, we are together forever.
Um, now we're going to have the three authors come up. I'm just going to very quickly bring the chairs up for them. So start thinking of your questions. process and how long it took all of the writers to write their books. Okay. <laughs> um, I think with my story collection, I probably wrote the first story in that book um, maybe around 2014 or something, um, and then finished the most recent one, you know, in the past year, really. Um, tucked one in at the last moment. But I will say, there is a story in the collection that I wrote that was done when I had my first collection. It was, it went to, you know, it was, it was part of that collection when it went out to publishers. And then I decided I, no, is that even right? I'm trying to remember. I think yes. And then I decided I wanted to have a unified story collection that was all linked. And if that one didn't fit in, so I took it out. And I realized, oh, this thematically fits in, and I like that story. So there's a very old story in this new collection as well. Um, over 10 years is the <laughs> short answer. Um, I mean, it's my first book, and you know, I started um, many of the stories uh, when I was in graduate school, um, and then you know, finished them uh, after, after, after the program. Um, and I also wrote a novel called Boomtown Girl that took me about four years. Um, and my agent couldn't sell it. So then I turned it into a short story, which as I told my students, I don't recommend this as a way of writing a short story. <laughs> <laughs> it's just too much work. Um, but, uh, so that's not the type of story of, of the collection. Yeah. Um, and it was really in the, during the beginning of COVID that you know, I looked at all these stories. And you know, I think I, one of the reasons it took me so long to write the book, um, aside from, you know, I had to, of course, learn the short story form and I had to learn how to write on that. Um, but I was also, I think, you know, under this, feeling this pressure um, to sort of be a good ambassador of my hometown and my home country. Um, and you know, I really felt like you know, this, this has to be like, a good book about Bangalore. And I realized that Bangalore is just too, too broad. Um, and once, you know, COVID sort of put it in perspective, you know, because it was, um, you know, we were all just sort of thrown into this sort of time warp almost, and I realized, oh, wait a minute, this is not a book about Bangor, this is a book about Bangor in the 90s. Um, and then it all came together. So how long did it take me to write uh, this? Uh, four years, six months, two weeks, and 14 hours. And, uh, uh, actually, I, uh, it was about four years. I wrote the middle story first. And so that one I, I wrote at the uh, beginning of the Trump administration when I thought the world was going to be blown up. And so it sort of has that going on in it. And, uh, and then uh, the others came along sort of on their own steam. So it was probably about, uh, about three or four years. Uh, 
Um, sure. Uh, the, the question, in case you didn't hear, is did, are the characters based on people I met when I was in Africa? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I think the characters are based on situations that I saw, uh, not on very specific people, although the settings are quite specific. So the, Sarah goes to a neighborhood in Stonetown called Shangani, which is where the apartment that I have is. And she visits a place which is the front of my apartment. And so that's how it sort of gets transmuted into the, into the story. I'm going to ask one more question, and then I think we'll wrap up so that people can go outside and enjoy some crackers. I hope you could hear me. Um, I was curious. Um, everybody seems to have written about a setting that they know, but they aren't in. And I was wondering if you find that distance from the setting to be uh, inspirational in some way. And I'd love to hear from all three if, if you have a response. Um, well, it's uh, it's interesting. I uh, so I have my novel, which is coming out, um, you know, four years, more than a year ago now. It's really been a long time away. That's set in Cambridge, um, but you know, there's a lot of uh, India in it. So I sort of had to, um, you know, or I, or I discovered writing that book what it's like to. Uh, you know, write from write a character who's over here, but also belongs in somewhere else. Um, I think to me, it's uh, you, say, you say distance, but uh, to me, it's almost like dimension. You know, like you're over here and you're writing about something over there. Um, uh, I think it's a huge asset for a writer because you have a sort of margin of awareness around the place, and you can put it, you know, in sort of context. Um, and also because it's a little further, um, you have to sort of make it real for yourself and for the reader. And so that sort of senses um, you can come in handy. I'm, I'm going to just answer very quickly and just say, I don't know how much it affected the way that I wrote the story. The one thing that was interesting to me was that I had a very specific location in mind, which is my own family that's from Hungary and lives in Canada. And when I wrote the story, I made it in Michigan. Because it's like, I write fiction. So <laughs> I'm gonna fictionalize it. And then right before I was, you know, I was doing page proofs, I thought, they're in Canada. This is so stupid. So I made it and I thought, you know, and I changed all the place names again. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, I think it helps me to think about it from some distance. You know, that is, in other words, although I go back to Tanzania, uh, you know, it helps me that I write here when I write about Tanzania. And, uh, and I've also written stories, you know, set in LA. I've written stories, you know, set in New Haven. Uh, and I've just conjured up those places, you know, out of out of my own memory, and then actually gone there to make sure that I didn't totally mess it up, you know, that it's it bear, bore some re relationship to what actually people would see on the ground. So I think it does uh, it does help me to have some distance. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. <laughs>